Thank you very much. I am so thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to lead off today, which is going to be a phenomenal experience for all of us. Just seeing all of you join together automatically creates energy and the buzz in the room last night was incredible. And I believe that very strongly that it's the energy that comes from our personal connections that can transcend so many challenges and difficulties that we all face in our work, in our lives, and how we move forward. And so please enjoy this as fuel for your own journey as leaders and as contributors to the incredible journey that we're on together that is about engaging patients, learning and working together, partnering for change. It's important to me to share with you some of the context of the KGH story. We're here today and we're celebrating and feeling so phenomenal having so many of you here with us. Our start in the journey was actually not an easy one. And when we think back about the past four and a half years, it's been a profound change and a period of change that we're still on. But four and a half years ago, our organization, or five years ago really, our organization was in trouble. It was in a great deal of difficulty. We had financial problems. Our patient outcomes were not ideal. Our operational efficiency was not up to par. Our sick time was high. Our morale was low. Government came in and literally took over our organization for a period of a year. It's a time that now we look back on and it's hard to be even thinking about. But it was the start of something that's happened that I can truly say we didn't plan all the steps. We didn't fully imagine what the feeling would be to be able to stand here today and share with you all the great things that are going on in the organization. But how did we get here? Because this story is not just about the what people are doing, but how we learned and grew together. And I'm going to share a bit of that with you and then talk about what that's meant for me as a leader and what I hope that you as leaders can take away and be in your own organizations and from wherever you are to be able to lead yourselves. We set out early in the days after, uh, as we were getting started in our go forward journey, to listen and learn from patients, from families, from staff, from the community. And we were shaping the strategy that Bill was talking about last night. We met with over 2,000 people. I was part of every single one of the groups to be able to listen. And we asked people about what does outstanding care always really mean to you? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Tell us a story about when you experienced, doesn't have to be a KJH, it could be anywhere in your life, when it, it was, it, the experience was, was really great with you as a patient, with you as a caregiver, with you as a family member, a supplier. What did it feel like? What happened? What were the behaviors? What were the interactions? And people started to tell stories that were truly remarkable. And it didn't matter about where those happened. We started to listen and hear about all kinds of themes that then started to shape the where we knew not just needed to go, but what started to happen is people started to talk about where they wanted to be. And that where you want to be, and that comes from somewhere inside. And there's good things that we imagined. But also I'll tell you, I remember distinctly one of the turning points in those sessions for me. We were at a group of, of people with, from the community and talking about outstanding care always. And a woman stood up and she said, Leslie, I'm afraid to come to your hospital. I thought, afraid? I mean, that, that, just, that, that just 
goes to a place that you don't even know exists in terms of how it makes you feel as a leader, as anybody in our organization, because that's not the feeling that we want at all. And so around that time, when I said, so tell us about it, and she started to tell her story. And around that same time, our team inside the hospital was setting out on the journey around the development of patient and family-centered care, rolling out a new model of care, of partnering with patients, and they had already started to talk to patients inside and said, would you help us figure out how we're going to move and how we're going to get better? And so with this woman also, I said, would you help us? We have so much to do, and we're not really sure how it's going to go. And she said yes, and she told me her story. And the other patient experience, who are now patient experience advisors, who at the time were patients, who said, I'm willing, like Marla, like Ann Dale, and others who said, you know what? Our experience actually hasn't been that great in your place either. But we're going to join you because we believe that you are sincere in saying that you want to learn and that you're listening. And we're going to figure it out together. And so we set down this path of creating the Patient and Family Advisory Council. And some remarkable things started to happen. Conversations about what is going on in the organization that we had never really heard about before. People would give vignettes about things that would make things better, visiting hours. Why do we have them? We have so many policies in our place, like I'm sure many of you do, that I don't even, I can't even list them. But there's a lot of them that get in the way of what the experience of patients and families can be in an ideal state to help them heal, to help us work together in more meaningful ways. And so one by one, we've been starting to unpack some of the tradition, some of the mindset, and we've been learning together about making our organization a place that is truly patient-centered. We made a decision early on in our strategy. We made a commitment that said any decision in our organization where there is a material impact on the experience of patients, a patient will be at the table. When you think about how many decisions in your organization happen, and then you open it up for saying a patient will be at the table, that's profound. We knew we weren't going to get there right away, but we decided let's put it out there and let's just figure out how we're going to move forward. And we're going to shift our mindset as well as an organization, not only at the frontline care, but of the notion of doing four and doing two. That is so hardwired inside our hospitals inside our professional upbringings, inside our traditions about how we work. But we wanted to soften those wires, and we really wanted to embrace the notion of doing with. In how we lead, how we think, how we plan, and how we care. So for me as a leader, I kept thinking as we've been growing, and there's been spectacular, organic growth, iterative. It's not been a grand plan. But we knew what we wanted it to feel like because that's what people told us. And we hold on to the voices. And that becomes internalized and that helps us go. And we don't just listen to the things that are good about where we want to go. We remember the pain as well. Because sometimes the pain and the tensions that will always emerge when you start to partner in meaningful ways, you got to keep those close because that helps make it real. We knew we didn't want the patient experience advisors to end up being the cheerleaders for the hospital because there's got to be the reality the things also don't always go right, and unless you can have people that are working with you in a respectful, engaging way, that are helping you hold up the mirror to yourself, where it gets uncomfortable, 
that's when you know actually you're making real progress. So I started to think about what does this mean for me as a leader? There's kind of this unleashing of this energy, this phenomenal movement almost inside the hospital that's starting to happen. What's my role? What's my place? Sometimes it's a get the heck out of the way. Sometimes it's about creating the conditions and keeping people centered on the why we're doing what we're doing. But what I started to think about was how do we, as leaders, make sure that there's a very systematic, disciplined approach that is applying all the thinking about continuous quality improvement? How do we make sure that we're applying that to leadership? So I put together, because I love to write, and I put together a patient-centered leadership checklist. I like checklists. I like being able to look at things, manageable amount of uh, things to do, and check them off because there's so many things in our day that make us very distracted. And checklists we know from the literature and from experience that really have helped patient safety and, and improving quality. So this patient-centered leadership checklist has four dimensions. And right now it's something that I've experimented with and I offer it to you as something that you can think about yourself. You can read about it, we'll share the links about where you can read about it, but listen about the kind and think about what it might mean for you. There's four domains. It's about sharing, assessing, including, and learning. First, the sharing. Organizations are about people, the communities of people. Sharing is about, as a leader, thinking, have I shared a story today about something incredible that I saw, special, small, or big, that I saw someone do that made the patient's experience better for someone? Don't just observe it and say, that was neat, that was wonderful. Tell the person that you've observed, said, wow, that made a difference. That's fantastic. And then tell someone else, I saw that. And it was so neat and I saw them make a difference. Sharing the story, sharing the observation, taking the responsibility to cultivate the stories about patient-centered care is a fundamental requisite of patient-centered leadership. Assessing. We uh, have so many indicators and performance metrics and numbers that surround us every day. So we've set out and said, and it's something that I continue to challenge our executive team, our organization, when we hear a number, you see a number, we do something now that's called peopleizing the numbers. I couldn't think of another word. <laughs> peopleizing, it's not really a word, but it's our word. Peopleize the numbers. So when you're looking at the waiting times for emergency department, it's not about the percentage of patients that are, that, uh, are waiting. You ask yourself, how many people had to wait today more time than we set as our target. Infection rates, there's 0 0.08 and, and percentages and things. My head hurts when I look at them. So I ask people now, I say, how many people came into our hospital without an infection and left because we gave them one? What happened? How many people were affected? And when you start to peopleize the numbers and every single number that you look at and you say, what's behind this? What's the story? How does this impact patients? It's such a simple thing, but we don't pause to do it enough. So I challenge you, peopleize your numbers. Everything you look at every day, just say, whoa, what does this mean for a patient? And translate that number. And if you can't figure it out, work with someone to find it. Inclusion is the third dimension of patient-centered leadership. 
That's where you ask yourself as a leader every day, have I included the voice of a patient today in the problem that I'm solving, in the work that I'm doing? You may not always be able to have somebody right beside you, but you can through your knowledge and sharing stories know what that voice would be or as a leader you seek out that voice in a deliberate way. So as a hospital CEO I make sure that I do rounds and I go and talk to patients. That keeps me grounded. It gives me part of its part of the pulse. I learn but with my checklist I make sure and I schedule the time so that I get out there, I talk to patients, Sometimes I don't know what it's going to be like, but I ask people, what can we do uh, better? Tell me about what your experience is about. And it's incredible the kinds of things that I learn. And now I keep a log. And in my blog on patient-centered care, I give examples of how you specifically, with that use of the checklist, can then say, OK, I went, I did my rounds. And then that leads us, I had connection leads us to the fourth dimension of leadership, patient-centered leadership. Ask yourself, what did I learn from a patient today? What did I learn from a patient today? Not what did I do to a patient, not even what did I do with, what did I learn from a patient today? And then the cycle begins again. The sharing, what did you learn? What did you observe others? the lens of assessing the numbers, the inclusion of the voice of the, the, the individual, of the patient experience into every problem solving, and then asking yourself again, what did I learn from a patient today? This to me is exciting because it's starting to give leaders a place that is important for cultivating the systematic, the, the dimensions of culture and of patient-centered care that can be truly supported. To unleash the phenomenal work that happens at the front line with every single, org, every single individual. But owning this responsibility and this accountability is important as part of the work of leadership. My experience at KGH, learning from patients, learning from our staff, and now learning from the incredible world out there in social media where we're having conversations with patients from all over the world and leaders about what they're doing. There is something happening now that's starting to shift. Patient engagement, I really, really believe in all my years of experience that I believe that patient engagement is now becoming the most disruptive and meaningful force of change in healthcare. It's something that is starting to take hold. And not because it's a plan, but because it's starting to get inside people. And once you start to look and see and feel what it's like to be centered engaging with patients and learning from them. Once you do that, you are forever changed. And then as you start to shift and move, behave, work with others in new and different ways, connect. Leadership is about connecting with others. And we come full circle. We're learners and we're leaders. And on my ask of all of you, who are here today is to rise to the challenge. And it's tough sometimes. This is not easy. Because patient-centered leadership, at the heart of leadership, leadership is personal. It's deeply personal. And by rising to the challenge of actually reflecting your beliefs in everything that you do, every choice that you make, every word that you say, every interaction that you have with others, you will contribute to that dynamic, disruptive, 
force of change. That is really, I think, finally, healthcare is finding, we're finding our way. We've reconnected with the reason why all of us are here in the first place. And I think it is the most exciting time to be in healthcare. And I really challenge you, welcome your participation, shake things up because that's the way change happens. Rely on each other, all the friends and colleagues that you're making today. Join me, join all the others that are here today in truly, truly being patient-centered leaders and making patient-centered care the absolute way things happen because it's right, it's good, and it's making a difference. Thank you very much.